Well, hello everyone. Thanks, thank you for being here today on a Monday morning for you. And thanks, Liam, for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you uh, today about fast radio bursts and the advances we have made in the field using Apertif. So Apertif is an instrument that has been installed at the Westerbork Synthesis Radio Telescope, which is uh, this array telescope shown uh, in this picture. And we have been carrying an FRB service since 2019. And actually, uh, tomorrow we are going to start our last week of observations uh, before uh, we finish with the survey. So my PhD research is mainly based on the data we have collected uh, during the survey, and it's what I'm going to talk about today. So here is an overview of my talk. Um, I'm going to start with an introduction on what fast radio bursts are, just to make sure that everyone knows about this. Uh, I'm going to discuss the main open questions, uh, then present their observational properties and their applications. I'm also going to talk about some instruments uh, that are uh, carrying FRB observations, including Apertif, and then I'll move on to the results where I will talk about, about our new one of FRBs and the repeater fo uh, follow-up we have been carrying, and I'll finish with the conclusions. So first of all, um, uh, uh, FRBs, well, fast radio bursts or FRBs are extragalactic millisecond duration radio transients. They are very energetic, but their origin is still unknown. This plot here uh, shows the first FRB uh, that was found, uh, and it is known as the Lorimer burst because it was found by Duncan Lorimer in 2007 uh, in archival data that was taken with the Parkes radio telescope in Australia back in 2001. Um, this type of plot that is known as a dynamic spectrum shows the radio intensity of the burst in a time versus frequency plot. As you can see, there's, there's a delay in the arrival time of low frequencies with respect to high frequencies. And this delay is quantified with the dispersion measure, or DM. Um, this dispersion measure is proportional to, to the amount of plasma between uh, the FRB, where it was emitted, and the Earth. So um, there are actually models of the Milky Way dispersion measure and the contribution we expect in certain directions of the sky. So what was really surprising about this burst was that, that the Milky Way contribution was only a small fraction of the total DM, which meant that the additional dispersion must be due uh, to the intergalactic medium, the host galaxy, and the environment local to the source, which meant that the source was extragalactic. And this marked the start of the field uh, of fast radio bursts in astronomy. We currently distinguish uh, FRBs into two different classes, on one hand, the one-off events, and on the other hand, the repeaters. As their name indicates, uh, the one-off events, or non-repeaters, are those that have only been seen once. There are currently um, about uh, 600 of them known, and they can be found in the transient name server database, database or TNS. And the large majority of those FRBs were discovered by a single instrument called CHIME uh, in Canada. Uh, the first one to be found was this Lorimer burst I mentioned earlier. And uh, the other type of FRBs are the repeaters, which are those that have been seen more than once. There are currently 24 of them published, and the first one was discovered in 2016, when repetitions from an FRB originally detected in 2012 were seen. Uh, this first repeating FRB is known as FRB 121102, or R1, for repeater 1. And uh, the repetition of FRBs uh, usually happens at random times. There's no periodic spacing between one burst and the next. But uh, in two FRBs, uh, there have, uh, they have detected periodic activity cycles. This means that for, uh, for some time, they are active, and you can expect to see um, bursts at random times, and for other times are quiescent, and these cycles of activity repeat periodically. So at present, uh, there is no consensus on whether repeaters and non-repeaters are the same type of phenomena, but repeaters are just more active, so we have seen them more than once, or if they are different uh, types of classes. So one important clue on solving this um, might be uh, 
the morphology of the bursts. When we look at one of FRBs, uh, we see three different uh, morphological types. The first one are the single component bursts, which are broadband. The second one, the single components, which are narrowband. And the third one, the multiple component bursts that peak at the same frequency. Repeaters, on the other hand, uh, show uh, uh, drift rates in, uh, in the frequency when they have multiple peaks, as you can see here. And this phenomenon is often called the sad trombone effect. So even if there have been several important discoveries in the past couple of years, there are still many things we don't know about FRBs. And the main questions we have right now is if repeaters and one-offs have the same origin, uh, what are the FRB progenitors and what is their emission mechanism? So what do we currently know and speculate about FRBs? So when trying to understand which sources produce FRBs, the question on, of whether repeaters and non-repeaters is a very important one. We do know uh, that magnetars can produce FRB-like emission, the best example being STR 1935 uh, plus 2154, a non-galactic magnetar that emitted a bright radio burst in 2020 that was detected by STAIR-2 and CHI. The burst had a lower luminosity than extragalactic, extragalactic FRBs, but it breaches the gap between the luminosity of galactic pulsars and magnetars with fast radio bursts. On the other hand, um, one-offs could be explained by catastrophic events, um, such as uh, different types of supernovae, uh, short gamma ray bursts or gravitational wave events, etc. And uh, there are uh, other mechanisms. So these two diagrams give a, a good overview of the potential uh, progenitors that we are currently considering. So um, in, in these two diagrams, the green boxes represent uh, the things that have been seen observationally, uh, including fast radio bursts uh, and magnetars the gray ones, the speculations, and the pink ones, the speculations where we expect a multi-wavelength counterpart to a fast radio burst. And here on the left, we have the scenario in which repeaters and non-repeaters have common progenitors, which would be in this case magnetars. And uh, on the right, we see the scenario in which they have uh, different progenitors and repeating FRBs would in this case be produced in magnetars and FRBs by catastrophic events. So in the previous slide, I showed what could produce FRBs, while here I summarized how they can be produced. Because of their high brightness temperatures and short duration, a coherent emission process from a compact source is required. Um, since there was already a lot of theory on pulsar emission at the time when FRBs were discovered, and there are uh, many similarities between pulsars and FRBs. Many FRB theory papers invoke uh, pulsar-like emission where magnetic interactions play an important role in producing the radio emission. Some of the mechanisms that people have proposed include uh, plasma effects, coherent curvature radiation, alpine waves, and one of the most popular at the moment are magnetar flares. The other most popular emission mechanism is the synchrotron maser model according to which the radio emission would be, would be produced uh, when a flare from the central engine that can be a magnetar, a compact binary, or other things, collides uh, with an ion shell that is surrounding it. And this produces shocks and radio emission. And there are other more exotic models as well. Each of these models make different predictions, and we are still in the process on com of, on, of comparing the predictions with the observables we have. So talking about observables, we're now going to see what we actually see uh, when we find FRBs. Starting by discussing their localization, the, the host galaxies where they have been found. The FRB field is still very young, so the localization of FRBs has started to happen very recently. There are currently 19 localized FRBs, six repeaters and 13 non-repeaters. The first FRB to be localized was R1, the first repeater, because repetition made it, made it much easier, of course, to pinpoint the origin of the source. And here is the localization of uh, this first repeater. 
it was found to be in a dwarf uh, galaxy with high star forming rates at a rate shift of around 0 0.2. But uh, the second FRB to be localized was actually a non repeater um, that was found using the DSA theme. Uh, so what we've seen so far with the current localizations, uh, uh, and here I show a sample of localized FRBs, is that uh, FRBs can be found in a broad variety of host galaxies, as you can see. Uh, so localizing FRBs to their host galaxies is a very important step to identify the kind of progenitors that lead to FRB sources, because we can compare these galaxies with the common hosts of other transients like uh, different types of supernovae, as well as short and long gamma ray bursts. Something that is also important to know is what we actually see when we detect an FRB. And uh, these observational properties tell us a lot about the propagation effects. In the general picture, an extragalactic radio source will encounter different media, first uh, uh, in its own environment, then its host galaxy, then the intergalactic medium, and finally the Milky Way before reaching Earth. So um, the light traveling through these different media will suffer from different propagation effects. One of them is the dispersion measure that I already mentioned earlier, that is due to the propagation through ionized plasma. And this produces a frequency dependent refraction index that uh, translates observationally as an arrival time delay proportional to the frequency to the minus two, so higher at lower frequencies. Another effect is the scattering, which is due to the propagation through inhomogeneous medium. Um, when the radio waves encounter a scattering screen, either at its host galaxy or the Milky Way, um, they, they will be scattered in a different direction. So this means that the rays that reach Earth will have traveled different path lengths and some of them arrive later. So we see this observationally as an exponential decay of the intensity proportional to uh, the frequency approximately to the minus four. So it is much higher at lower frequencies. Another effect is the scintillation. It is also due to the propagation through a turbulent medium, just like the scattering, but this time we see the effect in the frequency domain as patchy intensity variations that are produced when the waves that arrive at slightly different times to Earth um, interfere with each other. And it is proportional to the frequency to the four. So the bandwidth of these patches increases at higher frequencies. And the last propagation effect I want to mention is the Faraday rotation. This effect is due to the propagation uh, through a magnetized plasma. And the magnetic field will produce a difference in the travel speed of the right hand and left hand, left hand circularly polarized components. And as a result, the polarization position angle will oscillate uh, proportionally um, uh, to the square of the wavelength. And we quantify the Faraday rotation with the rotation measure or RM with a higher RM indicating the presence of an intense magnetic field. And these are the main propagation effects uh, that can be seen in FRBs. So since we understand these propagation effects sufficiently well, um, and most FRBs are produced at extragalactic distances, we can use them as cosmological tools as well. The number of FRBs and localization uh, has only be, uh, very recently be, uh, became large enough to start addressing some cosmological questions with them. The most popular application so far might be what we now call the mapboard relation in memory of JP mapboard, who established a relation between the dispersion measure and the redshift of localized galaxies that we can use uh, to measure the baryonic contents of the IGM. And the slope of this curve is proportional to the amounts of matter in the intergalactic medium. So this has been used to claim um, that the missing baryon problem is solved. <laughs> um, in another recent work led by Liam Connor and Vikram Ravi, they used the dispersion measures uh, reported in the first time in Fabi catalog, and they observed an excess of, of dispersion measure in the direction of the local group 
and other nearby galaxy groups. So this is a way to indirectly detect circumgalactic gas without needing very precise localizations. Okay, so now that I finished introducing FRBs, I'm going to talk about some of the instruments we use to uh, look for them and follow them up. There are radio telescopes all over the world, as you can see here. And, um, um, and here I'm showing those that have made import, uh, important FRB discoveries. Some of them have dedicated FRB service, and most of them are especially good in some specific area. For instance, Parks in Australia was the one to make the first few FRB detections. Um, ASCAP and DSA 10, for example, are very good at localizing FRBs. Uh, Fast in China is now starting to find FRBs at high redshift and also find thousands of bursts from repeating FRBs. Um, some other telescopes uh, like the VLA, DBT, and the now dead Arecibo are very sensitive and they are optimal for follow-up observations. LOFAR is the one that has found FRBs at the lowest frequencies. And Apertif, which is the telescope I have been working on during my PhD, combines a relatively high detection rates, uh, good localization, and the potential to follow up FRBs for a long time. And now I will talk about Apertif in more, more detail. So I hope you can see this video. Here I'm showing Apertif, which is this instrument installed here in the dishes of the Westerbork Synthesis Radio Telescope, which uh, is an interferometer of 12 dishes um, in the Netherlands. Each of the dishes has a diameter, uh, a diameter of 25 meters, and there's a bit more than one and a half kilometers between the first and the last of these 12 dishes. So Apertif has uh, several properties that make it an excellent FRB instrument. It has a central frequency of 1370 megahertz with a 300 megahertz bandwidth, a time resolution of 82 microseconds. And since it is an array in the east-west direction, it can uh, localize FRBs to narrow ellipses uh, in the north-south direction. Um, and for example, if it, re, uh, if it finds uh, a repeating FRB at two different hour angles, uh, the ellipses would cross and you could determine uh, very precisely where the FRB was originating. Um, the original Westerbork Synthesis Radio Telescope had a field of view of one of these circles in this image. So now with Apertif, we had a larger field of view of eight uh, square degrees. So making use of these properties in 2019, we started uh, the FRB searches. Our observing strategy consists mainly of following up known FRB sources, but uh, the large field of view allows uh, for detections of new FRBs uh, outside, uh, outside of the central beam. And we also target other regions uh, where with unknown FRBs, but only for around 10% of the time. And uh, currently we are observing of one week and then we have four weeks of imaging. And as I mentioned earlier, tomorrow we are starting our last week of observations. FRB searches are very computer intensive because of the continuous arrival of new data. So we installed ARTS, um, a hybrid supercomputer to store the data and run the FRB searches. And ARTS is actually how we call like the aperitif uh, time domain group. Um, we carry real-time FRB searches with the AMBER software and as well as real-time radio frequency interference cleaning. This produces candidate FRBs that are next uh, classified with a deep learning algorithm that uh, Liam developed. And finally, an email is sent to the observers with the remaining candidates. And we inspect those by eye and select the ones that look like real FRBs. Okay, so that was the introduction, and now I'm going to move on to the results uh, where I will discuss our new operative one of detections as well as the repeater follow up. So far in the survey, we have found 24 new one of FRBs, and these are their dynamic spectra, each one of them dispersed to the dispersion measure 
of, uh, of the FRB. Um, we find uh, DMs between 250 and 2800 parsecs per cubic centimeter with an average of around uh, 600. And we have a detection rates of slightly less than one per week. Um, we expect to publish the results um, into papers this, this year, one of them describing the art survey and the other one uh, the properties of the detected FRBs. And we have followed um, most of these FRBs for a very long, long time, but we haven't seen any of them to repeat. But also when we look at their morphologies, they seem to fall within the one-off um, morphological types, so we don't really expect them to repeat. Um, uh, so in these FRBs, we are able to see uh, some of the propagation phenomena I mentioned in the introduction. Uh, for instance, in eight of our FRBs, which is uh, one third of them, uh, marked here uh, with big pink rectangles, we see uh, scattering tails. The values of the scattering time scales we measure are shown in green in this histogram. These values are orders of magnitude larger than what we expect uh, from the contribution of the Milky Way. So they have very likely encountered a scattering screen in their host galaxy or in the environment surrounding them. Right now, the most complete FRB scattering distribution is the one uh, measured in CHIME FRBs, uh, which, is, uh, which is shown here. And each of them has been uh, converted um, using the, the frequency conversion for the scattering. Um, so since they observe at a lower frequency of 600 megahertz, the scattering there becomes much larger that, than at 1370 megahertz for the same FRB. Um, so what we see is that our, uh, our FRBs are much more scattered uh, than, the one that, that the, than the ones that CHIME is able to detect. So this can be very useful to try to understand the FRBs in which um, the, the environments in which FRBs live, especially when we don't have access to the host galaxy. Another propagation effect we are able to detect is scintillation, which is visible um, by eye in 10 of our FRBs. Unlike scattering, uh, our measure, measured scintillation bandwidths are consistent with what we expect from the Milky Way models. And this can also have important applications, especially to refine models of the distribution of free electrons in the Milky Way, since these FRBs provide with more lines of sight. And uh, two of our FRBs, this one here and this one there, um, have both uh, scattering and scintillation. So, um, this property can be used to set constraints on the distance between the FRB and the scattering screen at its host galaxy. The last thing I wanted to note about the operative FRB population is that we have found six FRBs marked uh, with these pink rectangles uh, with multiple components, uh, which corresponds to around 25% of the bursts. This is significantly different from uh, the amount of multi-component bursts that has been found in the CHIME catalog of just 5%. Um, however, after performing simulations and applying a bootstrapping technique, I found the lower percentage of single component sources in the time catalog to be probably due to the larger scattering time scales at lower frequencies, as well as the lower time resolution of CHIME that probably blurs together the components that are too close to, to each other, and they would be detected as a single component. So now I'm going to focus on some of the special one of FRBs that we have discovered. The first one uh, is an apertif uh, that was uh, the first apertif FRB that was published, FRB 2019-1108A, um, and this work was led by, by Liam. It was a very bright single component FRBs, and here you can see its dispersed uh, dynamic spectrum with a dispersion measure of 588 parsecs per cubic centimeters. Um, this FRB triggered the saving of the polarization data, so we could measure the Faraday rotation um, using uh, this data that you can see here, where we have uh, the intensity as well as the Q and use Stokes parameters as a function of frequency. 
and we measured a, a radiation measure of 474 radians per square meter. And it is one of the highest rotation, me rotation measures that have been uh, seen in one of FRBs. So using uh, the interferometer, um, we could localize this FRB to a narrow ellipse that is shown here in red. And uh, we saw that its line of sight passed very close to the local group galaxy M33 uh, with an impact parameter of only 18 kiloparsecs uh, between the source and the core of the galaxy. Um, and the line of sight also passes close to uh, the Andromeda galaxy M31. Uh, we found that the shared plasma of the local group galaxies could contribute to around 10% of this dispersion measure, but we found uh, no detectable scintillation and the porous scattering. Uh, but when we look at the Faraday rotation uh, compared to uh, that of other uh, sources within the same field of view, same here, we see that the value of this FRB is much higher than that of all of the other sources. This means that the rotation measure must have been produced local to the source, so it must live in a dense local magnetoionic environment in the source host galaxy. And this is something that has also been argued for other FRBs. We also had access to the operative imaging data, uh, but we found no persistent radio sources uh, coincident with the location of the FRB, which might have been ex uh, expected from a dense local magnetoionic environment. Now I'm going to move on to another FRB for which um, I'm currently uh, writing a paper about, uh, FRB 2020-1028. So last July, uh, Chime reported the discovery of three FRBs with periodic or quasi-periodic structure. Uh, the first one here, um, FRB 2019-1221A, has more than nine components with a spacing of around 200 milliseconds and uh, the spacing uh, between the components is periodic. However, uh, these other two FRBs have respectively five and six components with a spa spacing much smaller of just a few milliseconds. And uh, the periodicity of, of these components doesn't reach the three sigma threshold, so it is not significantly periodic. So uh, when we went back to our data, we saw that in 2020, we had detected one FRB, this uh, 2020 a that showed five quasi-periodic components. So very similar to these two FRBs um, uh, with a dispersion measure of around 400 parsecs per cubic centimeter. But the spacing between the components is around 0 0.4 milliseconds. And uh, we measured the significance of the periodicity, and it also doesn't reach the three sigma sh threshold. It does, it's just 2.5 sigma, so that, that's why we call it pseudo periodic. But uh, given the similarities between this FRB and these two time FRBs, they must have been produced in the same way. So we looked at three potential explanations uh, for this pseudo periodicity. Uh, first, uh, could it be explained uh, by a compact binary merger where we see uh, radiation from one of the two objects in the binary uh, right before the merger? Um, so this is a scenario that has been hypothesized to produce FRBs with different types of mergers between binary neutron stars, black hole neutron stars, and white dwarfs with either neutron stars or black holes. But it, I think it's quite illustrative to look at the gravitational wave signal of 1717, where you see how rapidly the frequency of the gravitational wave increases in the last seconds right before the merger. So uh, this increase in the frequency means uh, that if, if uh, this FRB was due to a compact uh, binary merger, the spacing between the components should decrease very rapidly. So we rule out this scenario. The next scenario would be uh, that the pseudo periodicity is produced by the rotation of a neutron star. So the subcomponent separations should correspond to the spin period. The fastest spinning neutron star known so far rotates at a frequency of 716 Hertz. So three times lower than this FRB, uh, which is around 2400 Hertz. 
um, so the issue of such a fast rotation is that the equation of state of the neutron star sets uh, what is called a mass shedding frequency limit, above which the outer layers of the neutron star are no longer uh, gravitationally bound. So if we plot this mass shedding limit in the mass to radius uh, diagram for a neutron star, all of the equations uh, of state to the right of this line uh, of this line are not compatible with the rotation. So as we can see, there are no equ equations of state that could explain such a fast rotation. So we also um, rule out the neutron star rotation scenario. And the last scenario we consider is that this pseudo periodicity is due to the structure of a magnetar's magnetosphere. Uh, we have a few pulsars that show complex pulse profiles that look a lot like this FRB, as you can see here, and also uh, they, they don't have a significant periodicity. And there are also uh, some magnetars, uh, especially this XDE 1810-197, that also show a very similar dynamic spectra. So this is actually the scenario that we are supporting. Okay, so that was all regarding the one-offs we have discovered, and now I'm going to move on to the repeater follow-up. The fir first observations we took, um, even before we started with the survey in, in 2019, were of the first repeating FRB 121102. We detected 30 bursts from this source, and here you can see a, a few in around 130 hours including uh, the two brightest bursts uh, seen at the time. And with these detections, we improved the constraints on the clustering of R1 bursts. We also observed the second known repeater for around 300 hours, but we found no detections. Um, R2 is a repeater found by CHIME. Its official name is uh, FRB 2018-0814A, and it is quite active at 600 megahertz. So these non-detections imply either that bursts are highly clustered in time and we weren't lucky with our scheduling or that the FRB has a steep speckle index so it's, it's mass, much less active or less bright at uh, 1370 megahertz. So as I mentioned earlier, upper TIF is able to localize single bursts to narrow ellipses. And this was put to test with our detection of another of Chime's uh, time repeating FRBs, FRB 2019-0208A. Um, the color map indicates Chime's original localization region. And just with a single detection, um, this is the localization we got, uh, this white ellipse that I zoomed in a little bit here. And this has shrunk the localization, the localization region by a factor larger than 100. And if we had a second uh, detection, we would be able to determine the host galaxy, but that's ha that hasn't been the case yet. Okay, so now that I have walked you through our follow-up of other non repeating sources, I will move on to a very special one, FRB 2018-0916B. It is the third repeating FRB known, and it was discovered by CHIME. That's why we also call it R3. It was later localized to a, a spiral galaxy located at 149 megaparsecs, very close to a, a star forming region. But the most special property about this FRB was that it was the first one uh, to be found to be periodically active with a period of 16.35 days. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this means that for a few days, in this case, five days, it is active and you can see bursts at any time within that activity window and then it's quiescent for 11 days before becoming active again. So uh, the detection of this periodicity um, led to many new models that tried to explain this periodic phenomenon. And we distinguish two main periodicity models, uh, the binary wind models in which we have the FRB source, probably a neutron star with a companion that can uh, be either another neutron star or a, a main sequence star that emits winds. And these winds uh, shield uh, the emission of the fast radio burst through free free absorption. So we can only see FRBs at the moment of the orbit when the FRB is facing uh, Earth. And the other type of models are the isolated magnetar models where uh, the periodicity would be either due to a very slow rotation 
uh, what we know as the ultra long period mantenance model or to the precession of the beam. So in order to have a better understanding of R3, we started a long follow-up campaign using, of course, Apertif, with which we spent 400 hours on source, but also LOFAR, which is um, another radio telescope in the Netherlands that observes at 100 megahertz, uh, 150 megahertz central frequency. And we spe spent 50 hours on source with LOFAR, all of them simultaneous to Apertif observations. LOFAR had been previously used in FRB searches, but all of them had been unsuccessful so far. So we were really excited uh, to see not only that we had detected R3 54 times with Apertif, which was the second largest data set of R3 bursts at the time, but also that we had detected it nine times with LOFAR, and these were the first detections of an FRB below 200 megahertz ever. And as you can see in this uh, composite dynamic spectra, uh, uh, the FRB was only visible either with Apertif or with LOFAR, never with the two instruments at the same time, meaning that the emission uh, was narrow band. And we published these results um, in August in Nature. So here you have a sample of some of the Apertif bursts we detected when I tried to show um, how different uh, the dynamic spectra with Apertif are, where you can see single component bursts, but then uh, there are other bursts with two, three, five, and even one with 12 components that show this uh, sad trombone effect where the components drift downward in frequency. The LOFAR bursts, bursts, on the other hand, all seem to show a single component, but they do have uh, a scattering tail and the scattering time scale um, corresponds uh, to what we expect from the Milky Way, um, about 50 milliseconds. But uh, the fact I have a question. I, you know, the yeah. apertif uh, time axis that you have, on the, it's hard for me to see, <coughs> um, uh, is different. Uh, in, yeah, yeah, that's it, in, it's look, different. it goes from like minus 15 to plus 15 milliseconds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And this so is minus 100 to 300. So you don't know anything about the structure in the low far. No, so no. So so I, I think that if there there was any any structure in the low far bursts, it would have been blurred together um, because of the scattering, yeah. probably. So that's probably why we don't see it. Right. Yeah. It could be, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't know that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the fact that we see um, FR FRBs with uh, LOFAR indicates that uh, there is not enough free-free uh, absorption to uh, shield the low frequency emission, and also the fact uh, that the scattering corresponds to what we expect uh, from the Milky Way means that there is no uh, significant contribution to the scattering in the host galaxy, so there's, the source must live in a relatively clean environment. But perhaps the most striking, pro striking property of our detections was uh, the multi-frequency activity behavior of R3. So in this plot, what, what I'm showing is the arrival phase of, uh, of the bursts um, within this 16.3-day uh, period. And the apertive bursts are shown in green, the time bursts in orange, and the low far bursts in red. And as you can see, the activity of FRB 2018 on I-16B peaks earlier and is narrower at higher frequencies than at lower frequencies. Perhaps this is not too visible for the low-far bursts, but we didn't have enough observations at late phases to better characterize the duration of the activity window there. Uh, but other detections uh, uh, by Sigi Pleonis and uh, et al. also support uh, this frequency trend. So the fact uh, that the activity window is narrower at higher frequencies is actually the opposite of what we expect from binary wind models, because free-free absorption uh, should shield uh, the low frequency emission for a longer time. So um, these observations actually for the ultra-long period magnetar, which is a bit strange because uh, a period of 16 days has never been observed um, in a pulsar or a magnetar before. But um, with this, I'm reaching uh, my conclusions. Um, 
uh, and in this talk I've presented you the operative findings and we have discovered uh, 24 one-off FRBs with which we are able to characterize the FRB population at 1370 megahertz. Uh, we see scattering scintillation and polarization properties uh, with which we, um, we can study uh, the environment uh, around FRBs as well as the ISM and the IGM. Um, with FRB 2019-1108A, we find that it must have been produced in a dense local magnetoionic environment. And uh, with FRB 2020-1028, we find a pseudoperiodic structure that is probably due to the magnetar's magnetosphere structure. Um, regarding the follow-up of repeating FRBs, we have carried, uh, carried out extensive follow-up campaigns uh, in which we have detected the first repeater FRB 121102. We have also improved the localization of FRB 2019-0208A, and we have characterized the multi-frequency properties of FRB 2018-0916B, uh, from which we, uh, we conclude that the periodicity cannot be due to wind in a binary system. And with all of this, we are able to better constrain the nature of repeating FRBs. Uh, so this was all. Uh, stay tuned for upcoming publications and thank you for much, so much for listening. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Inez. That was, that was super comprehensive. Great talk. Um, please raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you if you've got a question, starting with Vikram. Hi, Inez. Thanks, thanks so much for the talk. Um, can I ask the uh, detection rate question? So do you feel like the roughly one per week is what you expected, a bit lower, a bit higher, and why anyway? Yeah, so actually when, when we started the, the survey, I feel like the detection rate was higher than what it is right now. So um, I think that at the time when we started the observations, the, the detection rate was what we expected or even higher. Um, because we detected one FRB during the first uh, week of the survey. Uh, but lately, um, the detection rate seems to be going down, probably, I don't know, because the system is getting older. But um, it, it seems to match what we expected um, uh, before we started the survey. Um, and maybe just as a follow-up, does it have you compared it with, uh, with Chime or ASCAP? Your service with different frequencies, or different sensitivities, and does it does it um, make sense? Yeah, no, we, we haven't really done okay. that yet. Um, okay. There's still a lot of work in progress. I'm so sure. Yeah, we're yeah. definitely going to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, Shri. Yeah, I was uh, struck by that plot where you showed the dispersion. No, the scattering uh, histogram. Um. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it's sort of, it's one of two things. Uh, let's say that the- um, This one, right? Yeah, Pertif is, let's say, you know, I, again, I'm not sure this is true, but let's say given an average spectral index, et cetera, a Pertif is more sensitive than Chime. Not sure this is true, but uh, that's one possibility. Uh, but, I think the more likely possibility that it's such distinct ones is, of course, there's a cutoff here, which is your- uh, Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. Yeah, so, and, uh, the, uh, yeah. so that in fact, there's a wide distribution of these scattering measures and upper TF is picking, you know, uh, the ones with the larger fluence um because it can afford to do that and maybe the integration time is a bit what is the integration time in apertive uh it's 82 microseconds yeah it's not bad actually um so um you know the part i'm struck is that the frb rate sky rate is actually the true frb sky rate is increasing every day with every effect there are probably frbs with sub millisecond or microsecond once they'll add to the rate, then you have the scattering once they'll add to the rate. And then who knows what's that other frequencies. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. 
Has anyone done a kind of a scattering corrected all sky rate? Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. I've actually been trying to look at this like scattering distribution and the and the time one is the most complete one because well it's easier to do with a single instrument. Um, yeah, but I'm I'm still like trying to work on this to see if we have like a more universal scattering distribution that accounts for instruments at different frequencies and with different um, observing properties. But yeah, so we haven't done that yet. Yeah, yeah that uh, the talk was as a layer pointer to comprehend. So I, the part I didn't understand is the connection to mergers and rotate, uh, especially mergers. I mean, that seems like a stretch. I mean, you already know from the rate of these things. You're looking yeah, at yeah, yeah. It, yeah, of you know, course. You're not looking yeah, at a catastrophic event. So I think people in the FRB community shouldn't go around on these impossible um, models. Yeah, you uh, for the uh, for the binary mergers, you mean yeah, uh, the FRB the, with so, the periodic structure, right? Or the yeah, pseudo periodic structure? Yeah, I mean we were just looking at, at this as a possibility, and we proved that it yeah, doesn't but, work. But we weren't really expecting it to work yeah, for but other you, reasons. You have to anyways. multiply possibilities by the probability, which is so close to zero. Anyway, um, it sort of uh, you know gave a tinge of astroparticle physics to the talk, which yeah. is very really nice. You know, that's all I had. Okay. <laughs> just, just to add something to the scattering plot, which which is pretty amazing. I think the fact that Chime still has such a large detection rate, despite being so incomplete in scattering, tells you that the intrinsic rate is probably fairly red. Like the intrinsic rate at yeah. 600 megahertz is probably significantly higher than at L band, but. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vikram. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that on the point about the scattering and um, yeah, I mean, it's. I guess I was going to maybe I'll frame this as a question. What? Uh, okay, why? Why don't if you were to fill this up with your upper limits, what would this look like? Uh, with my upper limits on the scattering. Exactly. Oof, um, I I don't know because I I, th I think we don't have um, enough FRBs to know what our upper limits on the scattering is. Um, I've actually tried to start doing some kind of simulations um, to see like what is our completeness when we look at highly scattered bursts, but this is still work in progress. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think that if uh, bursts were very scattered, we wouldn't detect the FRB. No, I, I guess I mean the other way around. So like if you, for each um, burst, okay. when you fit, right, you probably have some upper limit on the scattering time scale um, from the fit to the to the burst profile. Uh, I think you, um, the first approximation, you would just have a big buildup at the DM smearing time scale. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it would be much lower than that, Liam. It would, it should be much lower because you're, it, it's, it's usually quite well. I mean, you're probing a very specific signal, right? Um, and so, like, an exponential tail, which is then convolved with the uh, DM smearing. That's and, fair. And the I mean, thing. and so not, usually not a, you get pretty, it gets lower than than the. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I guess the, where I'm going with this is. I'd be interested to know whether when you do that sort of fit, whether they whether they all go at, you know, your time resolution. I mean, it's usually below the time resolution. So it's probably somewhere between 10 and 100 micros, uh, microseconds. But it'd be interesting to know where and whether you are seeing the chime population is my point. Um, uh, we haven't done that yet, but um, I think we, we don't have enough FRBs to have any of them where we can like clearly distinguish um, the scattering from the uh, dispersion smearing, the intra-channel dispersion smearing. It's, sometimes it's, it's just too hard to, to know if you're seeing scattering or yeah. um, the smearing. So yeah. <laughs> Interesting, we, 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 should, we should talk more. Yeah, we, we've, okay. we've done this for previous bursts and you get, you do, you do get well under your time resolution in, in scattering okay. time scale yeah. sensitivity. Yeah, we should definitely, okay. yeah, if, if, in the fit. Yeah, cool. okay. we should talk more. Hey, Sterl has a question. Yeah, it was about this. So, so 
I guess I was also struck by the fact that I understand why Chime doesn't see the highly scattered ones, but the question of whether you do. So do, in this green histogram, that that's only showing you said there were 10 out of 50 or something that had highly scattered, 10 out of 24 that were highly scattered. So yeah. does that mean that there are there are 14 which are probably hiding down there somewhere at or below yeah. your time resolution. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, the others so, must So be. I think this is sort of related to the question Vikram was asking. If you stick those 14 somewhere at or below your resolution, it seems no, to me the I... distribution is still different from time, but not as dramatically different as it is now. Yeah, that, that could be. Yeah, I, I just, I didn't put them in this histogram because, yeah, I... I haven't computed like upper limits on the scattering or anything, but yeah, uh, I think there, uh, the distribution would still be like at higher uh, scattering that would, uh, that would chime sees, like just looking at the amount of FRBs that are highly, uh, that are visibly scattered in our, in our sample. Yeah. Right, but yeah. I mean, I guess it's clear why Chime has a cutoff at the at the high end. But I, I guess the mm. the interesting question is whether one can make a sensible single distribution of scattering, yeah. or whether yeah. there's something intrinsically different or very different rate at the low frequency, six hundred megahertz and one point four gigahertz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've been trying to think about ways to to make this like joint distribution and like this black line here is just like a very simple um, approach to find like this joint distribution, which is definitely not how it really looks like. But yeah, it's it's a bit hard to, to um, join these two different distributions at different frequencies with uh, so many different ob observing properties. Yeah. Okay, Kunal. Can't hear you, Kunal. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Some issue with Zoom. Sorry about that. Uh, but anyways, thanks for the nice talk. I had a... Uh, sorry, the sound is... Sorry. Uh, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, with reference to your detections versus... Sorry, Some Kunal, you keep dropping goes, out. Yeah. Keep dropping out. Is it worth just typing it in the chat? Uh, I'm going to try one thing. Um, some issue with uh, Zoom. Okay, I'm hoping it'll stay now. All right. Uh, with reference to the number of detections versus phase plot from the nature paper, yeah. um, you said that uh, the binary model is uh, ruled out, but... Um, yeah, you seem to favor the single magnetar model. Um, so I'm wondering whether this sort of behavior is like inherently expected in some ways from like single isolated magnetars or uh, is there some strong argument in favor of that model or uh, is it just because one is ruled out so it must be the other? Um, yeah, so there is actually something we see uh, in radio pulsars, which is that the um, the pulse profile is bro is broader at lower frequencies, um, and I think it's something called uh, radius to frequency mapping because at lower frequencies you're seeing like higher parts of the magnetosphere, so it's like broader. Um, so this is actually something you might expect uh, from an isolated magnetar. Um, yeah, I don't know if. That but then the really precession working. itself, one needs to rely on the precession in order to explain it through that model, right? Yeah, um, so for the, the precession, there are actually other reasons why we believe it's it's not the case that I didn't mention in this talk. Um, so for the R3 bursts, for some of them, we also had polarization information. And in this, uh, in this polarization, we see that the angle remains flat during the burst. But if it was a precessing magnetar, you would actually expect uh, the polarization angle to uh, to vary um, because um, uh, when it rotates, uh, you ch uh, you change the angle under which you see um, the magnetic field of the magnetar. 
So uh, the fact that the polarization remains flat um, means that it's more unlikely that uh, it's depreciation. Hmm. Does that answer your oh, question? So there is some, so the periodicity is still not explained, but this this sort of, I mean, uh, frequency chromatic behavior is, yeah. is seems reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah, but it's still like, we have never seen uh, a magnetar with such a long period. Uh, so I think we still don't understand very well what's going on, but at least with these observations, we are able to um, disfavor some scenarios. Interesting. And does anyone here know what magnetic fields would be required to produce these? I mean, are we talking about 10 to the 16? Um, if at all there is like this periodicity holds up in terms of the spin period, then it's still 10 to the 16 Gauss kind of, uh, that would be the magnetic fields. Does... I, I don't know that. I don't know if anybody else knows that. Thank you. We need, we need Paz for that one. He wrote the ultra long period. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. One quick final one from Shri, I think. Yeah, so I I don't know the, the coordinates, but I think there's an X-ray source in the center of a remnant, and the claim is it is a period of six days. And yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so there, there was. Yeah, you may want to take a look at that, um, and uh, you know, as one of your. Uh, yeah, uh, I I think we. I don't remember if we cite that paper, but um, yeah, it's definitely so something yeah, we took okay. into account that um, there is like a six hour period magnetar. But back to the scattering, which I guess many of us seem to be both excited <laughs> and slightly bothered. Um, it, uh, the fact that I still pointed out, okay, the fact that your cutoff, you know, is the, the fact they're so distinct, it does, uh, yeah. This suggests to me, well, at least at the very least, you should go and uh, I think independently figure out what is your true averaging time in some some way here, okay? That is, yeah. can you take yeah. this histogram and then there's a response to scattering and divide out at that response and then it'll be useful to know what it looks like. And yeah, maybe yeah, if yeah. it's a small number statistic, maybe it'll turn out that one point, the last point, the green bar there will be enormous, but, um, and also it'd be better if, you know, if you had some, some information, something really on the sky that actually can say, yeah, I can actually resolve that or I can detect it or maybe inject a fake signal in your pipeline. Uh, I think that's very well worth doing because this is an important clue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, maybe Liam knows more about this, but I think um, um, you try to inject some signals like before we started the survey. I'm not sure about that, um, but I think it, uh, we never did that. Um, so since uh, the survey is finishing um, after next week, um, what I'm currently thinking about doing is more like uh, simulate um, FRBs and see how they would look like um, with uh, our current uh, time resolution and frequency resolution and see like how um, the original shape of, of the fast radio burst uh, is seen uh, with our um, with the observing properties of, of operative and use that as some kind of um, uh, function uh, to correct for uh, the number of FRBs we detect that that's what I have been um, trying to work on, but I haven't finished with that yet. Okay, well, that was a fun discussion. Thank you again, Inez. Uh, we're five minutes yeah, away. Yeah. Um, okay, take care. Yeah, thank you.